Len Dayton. Len Dayton is a Londoner, and in true Dickensian fashion, by a series of accidents, he was born in a workhouse. But he was brought up in this very grand London square, Montague Square. Well, not exactly in the square, behind the square, in the mews, because his parents worked at a great house. His life continued to follow a rather Dickensian pattern. He went from job to job, all different, but all just keeping him going, until he landed up an international best-selling writer. You've probably read some of his books, The Ipcris File, Billion Dollar Brain, Horse Under Water, Funeral in Berlin, Bomber, or seen them as films, or at least seen them on the paperback racks up and down the country. This is his latest book, Fighter, the true story of the Battle of Britain. He now lives part of the time in Portugal, and it was there I went to talk to him. We began with his first novel, The Ipcris File. I went on holiday, and I decided I would write a story. You see, the, most people who come to writing books have an experience of writing words uh, before. I mean, they are, they're journalists or they're writers or they have a, a sort of literary experience. Now, those people know certain basic facts about writing books, which I didn't know. Uh, for instance, they know that a book it tends to be between 70 and 100,000 words long, and they have a very good idea of how many words 100,000 words is. They know the sort of body of work which they're embarking on. This is really one of the reasons, I believe, why journalists plan to write books, but uh, very often don't ever get around to it, because they're intimidated by the knowledge of how much work there is ahead of them when they begin. Now, I didn't know that, you see. I had no idea of how... Uh, I didn't know how many words there, there were in a book. Uh, I didn't know how long, for all I knew. You sat down and wrote a book, and by the weekend it was ready, you see. I had absolutely no idea. So, uh, when I say to you that I started out to write uh, Ibn Kresvall as a story, I, I think I had no idea whether it would be a short story or a long story or a book. I don't think I embarked on it with the idea this would be a book. And when I was halfway through it, I put it aside. It was just a fun thing. I, I did it for amusement, you see. I didn't really think of it as being published. I put it aside, and when I went on holiday again the next year, I wrote the rest of it. And then I came back to London, and I was still doing drawings for a living, and I put it in a drawer, and I didn't do anything about it, you see, I, I, which seems to indicate to me that I didn't have a strong ambition to be a writer in that sense. It had been a fun thing to write. I'd got a lot of fun out of writing it. Uh, it wasn't a paramount ambition, I think, to, uh, to see it published. Um, but then I met a man at a party. I'm always meeting men at parties. I must have gone to a lot of parties in those, I think. And I met a man at a party and he said uh, that he would like to see. He was a literary agent and he said, well, I was talking to him about things and I mentioned this and he said, well, won't you let me have it? Uh, and I'll read it, and if I think that it, it's sellable, I'll take it along. And so I, I said, all right. And then he eventually, after being turned down a couple of places, he found a publisher who was prepared to publish it, and that, that was Ibgress Fire. But I think the, the nature of the book is uh, uh, completely self-indulgent. I mean, there's no other word. It is the most self-indulgent book ever written, probably, because I, I did it as, as an exercise in self-indulgence. I didn't do it uh, as, as a, with a view to, to taking it to a publisher and getting it published. And yet it subsequently went on to sell about two million copies. A lot of people, a lot of good critics, when they received it at the time, spoke about its uh, skillful structure and its uh, taught, well-worked-out plot. Uh, and although these things are bringing you a smile to your... If you can't deny the fact that it was, it seems to be, to someone who knows nothing about that world, myself, um, astonishingly well-researched. And in your account of the writing of this book, you never mentioned one thing about finding out about spies and spy networks or anything like that. Did you, did you do any of the research that, uh, that the critics well, uh, applauded you for? It's very difficult to answer, quite simply in as much as... Um, uh, one person's level of expertise is different to another. I mean, what I might think is common knowledge about aeroplanes, you could possibly think is extremely kind He's of a boring and esoteric. You see what I mean? Yeah. And the same, and I might be talking to someone about football, 
and they couldn't conceive of how little I know about football. It would be very different. And I suppose that at that time I had interested myself, for, I don't know for what reason, in the kind of world of espionage and the history of espionage. And uh, I did know uh, enough about it to sort of cobble together a fairly convincing yarn about it. Had you actually met <coughs> any spies? Oh, yes, several. When did you meet them? When you were at art college? As, oh, a, as an air steward? As a waiter? <laughs> or which particular...? Well, I suppose it sort of depends on uh, what a spy is. Uh, that um, I suppose that I should really have said that I met a lot of people who have had experience of spying in one way or another. Um, that I found that from when I wrote Ibcrass File, I was, doing those days, I would be doing drawings, uh, and a lot of the time I would be doing drawings for newspapers, and uh, within my circle of friends, there were quite a few reporters, and I had been a, during the time I was at art school, I'd been a press photographer myself, so that I, doing the time of my middle twenties, I was mixing with a lot of people who were uh, in the press, and I would find that I'd had access to all sorts of unprintable material, because I would be standing at a bar talking to people and they'd say this, uh, in, very interesting, we're not going to print this story, it's a very interesting thing that happened to me last weekend and so on. And I found that after I'd printed Ib uh, Ibcress file, that these same people, because they knew me, uh, not intimately, they knew me fairly well, would come over and say, now there's something for you, Len. I mean, this still happens to me a lot. So when I say that I met a lot of people involved in spying, I think that most of the people have come to me rather a long time after they've ceased to be involved in spying, but uh, have come up to me because they, people like to tell you stories, especially if they're personal experiences, uh, and or perhaps I just attract people who like to talk to me. But I, uh, I found, I mean, the, the great problem I find in writing books is throwing stuff away. I mean, there's no difficulty of getting material. I get enormous amounts of material. One of the reasons why I find I have to hide away in order to work is because I attract an enormous amount of material. When you were writing the book, did you feel that the people on Harry's side were doing something for something that was worth defending? Did you, what did you feel about the moral issues involved? I have never tried to keep any philosophical continuity in the books. In fact, someone was talking to me only a month ago and they said how interesting it was that the hero of the books gets older and changes his mind about so many things. Well, I'd never thought of the person as being the same person, but I suppose that the, that character was right in, in saying that because I do let my own fairly experimental views uh, come out in the book. You see, my, perhaps I, I should add something here, that I don't believe it's my role in life to tell other people how to run their lives or to tell them how to do anything. But I think that it's a legitimate thing for, even within the context of a thriller, I think it's legitimate to question the ideas that are prevalent around one. But on the whole, your heroes aren't very self-questioning at all. They're more concerned with actions than with thoughts, aren't they? Well, I, I think that's, that's true. And I think that um, it, people who write the sort of books I write are essentially in the entertainment business. And they will be judged according to how successful they are entertaining the reader. And anything they else they want to do has to be done a, in a way that is subordinate to the main task of, of entertaining the reader. And I think that the sort of books I write are essentially action books, that they, people move, that they do think, but 
they don't spend too many pages in thinking, if you said I mean. They have to, uh, there has to be a pace with it. When you say, I'm in an entertainment business, are you, uh, you're separating yourself from uh, people you would call novelists, is that? Well, it depends how you use the word novel. I mean, I think novelists at one time were people who wrote the sort of books that uh, Victorian housemaids took to bed at night and read. Well, I'd be very happy to be identified as a novelist in that context. Um, but I'm afraid that the way that the word is used nowadays to mean a, a, a profound and philosophical works, and I wouldn't uh, want to frighten anyone away from a good read uh, by attaching a label like that to anything that I do. I, d I mean, I've, I had never read a James Bond book, uh, but by an extraordinary coincidence, the month, I mean, I didn't know how publisher schedules worked or anything, but it happened that the month that Ibcress file was published was the month in which the first James Bond film uh, appeared in the West End. And another one of my friends, I mean, you couldn't possibly be big-headed if you have friends as well, I have. Another one of my friends uh, came up to me and they said, yes, you've been very lucky, Len, because you're a bl blunt instrument that the critics have used to smash Ian Fleming over the head. <laughs> and this is really, uh, I think, true. That a lot of people who didn't like the sort, of the, perhaps liked the film, but they didn't like the sort of success the film was having, were over-generous it, to me, when I came along with something which was uh, a substantially different thing to to the James Bond books, and so people were they would say, "No, look, this is much more interesting than the James Bond uh, books," uh, simply because the film was attracting enormous sort of queues of people and so on. Uh, in the Ipcris file, one of the strongest things that comes out uh, in Dialogue, and although it might, you might, you might uh, disdain to call it a novel of ideas, the idea of the English class structure is very powerful in it. Does the English class system uh, amuse you or depress you? Well, I think it amuses me more than it depresses me because everyone seems to like it so much. It's, I find it's difficult to be depressed about something which everyone enjoys so much. In the collection of stories, Declarations of War, there's one story called It Must Have Been Two Other Fellas, which deals with class, and at the same time, it's a sort of double exposure because it's set in 1970. It's about Colonel Pelling and a Corporal Wool, whose paths crossed in the war, and so they're meeting 25 years later. The Corporal's now a commercial traveller, doing very well, and the Colonel's a wealthy landowner, although you wouldn't know it to look at him. Like your father, the Colonel's obsessed with engines, and he's working one Sunday in his tenant's garage when his ex-corporal, now a commercial traveller, arrives to buy petrol and jumps to the conclusion that the Colonel now makes his living as a petrol pump attendant. You must have enjoyed writing that because it Very has much. so many cross-currents going Very on much, about yes. war and class and the results of army service. And, of course, all the distortions of memory and the way in which people remember things they want to remember and the way people actually deal so fondly with the, the bits of memory they want to remember. What would you say were the most important facts about your childhood? Well, I suppose the most important fact about one's childhood is that your parents love you, isn't it, really? I think that uh, there's nothing that parents can give a child more than love and, and attention and so on. I suppose that's the, the most important uh, fact, that I grew up without having any kind of hang-ups or feeling very bitter or wanting to do uh, any very strenuous reforming or anything. <laughs> You grew up, your parents were, uh, worked in a, a big house, as it were. Yeah, that's right. My father was a chauffeur in uh, London, in Maribyrn, and uh, my mother was a cook, sort of upstairs, downstairs kind of uh, scene, you know. Did you have a lot of hobbies which you pursued passionately? Oh, yes, I think what I did. What were they? Uh, I, making model aeroplanes. I, I distinctly remember that I was I incredibly uh, uh, dedicated to aeroplanes in all shapes or form. In fact, that was my all-consuming ambition when I was a child, was to fly an aeroplane. My father was constantly saying how much it puzzled him because I'd not been exposed to aeroplanes in any particular way. And it's difficult now to 
explain to to people who have become who, for whom the car has become such an ordinary adjunct of life how devoted my father was to motor cars was uh, he an expert mechanic as well yes yes he was in fact he uh, i can't remember the any motor car ever being taken to uh, for repairs you see he made it was a point of honor that he made everything i mean he made gaskets himself he uh, he had a sort of workbench and he would work in metal and if a piece broke he would want to make that that piece himself. But he, the job of a chauffeur in those days of course was to be a fitter, an engineer and a, a general uh, a sort of genius with, with motor cars. Did you help yes. your father in his workshop then? Well, I did. I mean to some extent I know how motor cars work but um, my father was rather a <laughs> short-tempered man <laughs> and I think that uh, it was when I was being a refugee from my father's temper that I became interested in my mother cooking, which is how I got into the idea of cooking. My, my mother was and is a very easy-going person. I, she tells me stories of how she let me make pastry in spite of the fact that my hands were dirty and, and, uh, and that she finally had to sort of throw it all away. But she would indulge me in ideas of, of, of cooking quite complicated things, whereas my father had no patience with people who made mistakes. Uh, he, everything had to be done perfectly. In some uh, autobiographical piece I've read, you were very uh, uh, modest and disarming, saying that you're more or less good at nothing. Yeah, that's fair. I'm not being <laughs> modest and disarming. That really is. I couldn't uh, sustain any other <laughs> sort of claim. I really was uh, uh, good at nothing. Perhaps if I think schooling is different now and they try to find things that children have aptitude for. But in the days when schooling really consisted of sport and sums, I certainly wasn't good at either uh, of those things. I went to a local school and in those days they had a thing called the, I don't know what they would call it, but it was sort of the 11 plus examination, which if you pass, you go on to another school. I passed that exam almost exactly at the outbreak of war, which was when all the schools closed down, in London anyway, so there were no schools. So I was left to uh, sort of uh, fend my, for myself, more or less. When you, were, when you were at school and the war was going on, did you, with your interest in aeroplanes and that, and wanting to be a pilot, could you, as it were, not wait to get into the RAF? Oh, I was very keen, mad keen, yes. I mean, it, it demonstrates how much one gets um, uh, sort of drawn up into the particular sort of, um, sort of hysteria uh, of war. But as I remember it, I wouldn't want to misremember it uh, deliberately, but as I remember it, I was much more interested in the idea of flying than in the idea of getting into fighting. I can't remember uh, having any particular desire to sort of bomb anyone or shoot things down. But gradually, of course, I, I became more seriously interested in the problems of drawing, so that by the time I went into the Air Force, I was less interested in being in the Air Force. I'd, my ambitions had, had subtly changed. So when I went into the Air Force, I made every effort to be a photographer, which is what happened. So I spent two and a half years as an Air Force photographer, doing a certain amount of flying as well, luckily. But by that time, my sights were set on a, a different sort of life that I wanted. And you came out and went to art college. Was this in order to be a, a, a painter, an artist, or did you... Uh, reckon on taking your place as a, a commercial artist? Yes, I think I'd probably... I think if you have working-class parents who have only enough money to... You know, you're not looking forward to an expectation of, of being left money, then I think you probably look forward to a life where you have a regular income of some sort. I think that uh, taking on uh, the life of a painter is a is a middle class and upper middle class ambition that uh, I certainly one that I didn't entertain. I did three years at art school, and I was emboldened then to try for a scholarship at the Royal College of Art uh, because I felt I had nothing to lose. So I, I mean, I've been enormously lucky with. Um, 
this sort of examiner. I mean, I always feel immensely grateful to people who were generous in, in extending this sort of opportunity because I was thinking I was probably a very obnoxious... I mean, I don't think I would have seen the potential that these people saw. Do you see what I mean? That I think I was a very brash, rather aggressive, unattractive sort of personality. After I'd done my time at the Royal College and uh, become the world's oldest child protégé, I felt I ought to go and get a real job for a change, see what the world was all about. So I've applied for... A, a job as a steward on BOAC because someone said, well, look, you, you will never get a job as an airline steward. And I said, well, why not? Because I'd worked as a waiter. You see, during the time I was a student, I'd worked as a waiter and assistant cook. And Anyway, I, they said, well, you're never going to get a job doing that because you'll have to speak a foreign language. They said, don't even bother to apply if you don't. So I went along to BOC and they said, do you speak a foreign language? And uh, on that split second, I said, yes, German, you see, which was a terrible sort of lie, really. I didn't speak German. The so only German I knew was from old British war films, like Schweinhund and things like that. And they asked me a lot of questions about food, which I could answer f fairly intelligently, and that went all right. And then I thought, any minute now, there's going to come the question about German. And they said, they looked at the form and said, I understand you can speak German. And I said, well, not terribly well, I thought. That would be a good thing to say. So I said, not terribly well. And I thought, here it comes. Now, this is going to be my downfall. But they all whispered together. Then someone said, well, we're going to have to take your word for that because there's no one on the examining board who speaks German, which is a terrific thing. It did make me feel terribly guilty, but it was a great piece of luck. And that's how I worked for BOC for a year. And, uh, and that was my sort of... Uh, uh, sabbatical year, I suppose, in a way. And then after that, I started work. I, I then began... I went to live in New York and uh, began working as an illustrator in uh, using the years and years of training that uh, I'd And had. that's what you wanted to do, be an illustrator? Yes, I think that is what I wanted to do. It is incredibly difficult. In a way, the whole process of drawing and painting is much more difficult, I, ch I use that word difficult, uh, not more complex, than, than writing. It is incredibly difficult. I admire immensely the people who are skilled in drawing, and I admire very much the intensity of their vision and the way they look at things. Uh, I, I'm very much a visual person, and I think perhaps to a lesser extent today, but certainly in the earlier books, I think they're very much the books of an art student. They're very much preoccupied with seeing things and uh, descriptions, and they're not literary descriptions. That what was it about, you this particular, about this particular place, Albi Ferra, that, uh, that attracted you? You say uh, it attracted me in two ways. It attracted me to be here, knowing it was very difficult to get here, and it also attracted me as a place to set a book. Um, because in those days I was very conscious of the idea of using my travel experiences. Well, you uh, liked it enough to put your <laughs> you set your next book here, didn't you? Horse yes, Underwater. Yes, I, I did, yes. Yeah. It's a very unusual town. I think that uh, the way in which the houses are set into the cliff top is extraordinary. The way in which, for instance, one walks from the front doors of the houses and finds oneself on the top floor of the houses with all the other levels being being lower down the cliff and the way in which only one house had access to the lower cliff uh, it all the whole of Albuquerque seemed to contain a lot of ingredients that were ready made for a, a spy thriller and there is quite a lot of the sort of Arabic influence here the little hands of Fatima on the door knockers, for instance. What do you yourself feel, having come to this place uh, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, 10, 15, 10, 12, 15 years ago, um, and now sort of England's caught up with you in a way, because even going around the streets a little bit in the last day or two, even in the off-season here, it's quite a lot of English voices and quite a lot of English tourists and tourist shops opening up and big tourist hotels and English is spoken in lots of bars and so on and so forth. Um, 
have, have you run sort of back and found yourself where you started? But I have very little social life anywhere. My home life is so happy that I uh, am, am very content with it, with the, the children and Isabel San, that this uh, suits me, so that I don't know very much about the way in which the social life of English people and, and foreigners here is a bit of a closed book to me. I think it probably goes on, but I, I don't know very much about it. <laughs> After uh, 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 horse, uh, Ipcress File, Horse Underwater, Expensive Place to Die, and Funeral in Berlin, and a couple of other books, uh, one to do with Cookery and one to do with London, both of which, uh, in a sense, come out of your childhood as well. Yeah. The next book you wrote, Bomber, uh, which is a, you know, the longest book you've written yes. and was intensely well researched about one day, a fictional day, June yes. 31st, uh, when there's a heavy bombing attack, six or seven hundred Lancasters, Stirlings and Wellingtons go to attack uh, somewhere on the Ruhr. There's a mistake and they bomb a small, uh, harmless little town instead and raise it to the ground. It's told from the point of view of the Luftwaffe and the RAF and the people in the town. Um, now, why did you want to do that? It's a massive book. I think it's a magnificent book. It's terrifically well researched. Could you tell us why you wanted to do that and how you set about it? If I'm to be honest with you, I, I, I don't know. I had spent the previous couple of years working in the film industry. And once again, just as earlier in my life, I'd started writing books because I was fed up with working with very large groups of people and having ideas modified and sometimes improved, of course, but in any case changed by corporate decisions. So when I wanted to write Bomber, it was essentially a book that emerged from my desire to sit in a room on my own, figuratively speaking, and, and work on a book. I'm awfully interested. I've been interested in the history of the Second World War in particular for many, many years. I started out writing notes of the history of warfare when I think I, before I was 20, probably, I was interested in the history of warfare and began sketching out the idea of writing it all down. In that way, when you are a teenager, you want to write down everything you know. Do you know that sort of thing? So it is a, and I had that sort of feeling, and I felt like writing a, a war book. And there were certain things about the bombing raid which fascinated me very much. It, I was fascinated by the way in which if you take, if you take uh, the world, that the, a bombing raid on the Berlin consisted of a lot of men going up sort of 20,000 feet or so in the air, are then travelling a very, very, very long distance across the globe, are then travelling an enormous like, distance back and going home. It had a curious shape to it. Do you see a sort of fascinating thing of coming so close to these cities, and then but never visiting them? I mean, these airmen had never been abroad even, and that, there they were. They'd they'd been just a few thousand feet over the top of these different uh, places. That fascinated me, and the fact that there was a connection. There was an electronic connection. The idea that on the German side, they these aircraft were being contacted by means of radar beams, and that there were people who were going to be bombed, that there were, in fact... When I encountered this sort of information, I had the same sort of excitement which I sometimes find in people who are keen on science fiction. And I think that it was this unreal quality of electronic warfare which made me want to mix it with humans. And a man uh, 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 had said to me um, uh, some little time before I started doing the book, he said, you should write a book about machines because you like machines. He said, very few people like machines, and you like machines, and you should consider writing a book uh, in which you display this interest. An affection. Yes, yes. I, because, you see, I think... Machines can't make mistakes. There is a, a, a malign suggestion uh, distributed by banks that computers make mistakes. I want to tell you that computers cannot make mistakes. And anyone who suggests that a computer ma can make a mistake is imbuing a computer with characteristics which are only those of human beings. One of the things about Bomber is the way in which 
It could almost be said that the quality of the man is judged by the quality of the relationship with the machine. The best pilots, the best, the man who works the radar so very well, Augustus yes, Bach, uh, uh, Lauen, yes, Lauen yes. on the German yes. side, and, uh, and um, Lambert on the English side. Yes. They treat their machines very, very well, and in a sense their moral qualities follow from that. The book went through 25 drafts. You, you put it through a computer to check up on your fact. Uh, but but I, I did, in fact, so I so even had more. So so I mean, more. I did have more. It's amazing that I probably had five, six, seven times. I mean, I, I happened to look through my notes and I estimated that my handwritten notes for Bomber were, must have been over half a million words. Um, now that's without all the printed material that, that I'm at. That's without letters from people and it's without tape recordings, it's without all of the uh, files of stuff and clippings and cuttings and books. And The book started, it seems to me, from an anti-war feeling. Yeah. You say, uh, this book started many years ago when somebody told me that it had yeah. come out of a briefing and yes. the men had cheered Yes. when they'd been told that Stirlings were going to go That's on right. the bombing expedition because they knew that Stirlings were slower and flew lower and were liable to get knocked off whereas they flying higher would not get knocked That's off right. so they were that much safer because their friends presumably right. in the Stirlings <laughs> were yeah. the uh, soft underbelly going yes. through the night sky kind of thing. And, that, and the book is full of an anti-war feeling which is not propagandist because it's yes. spread in all sorts of ways but that would be true to say that. Well, Someone wrote uh, uh, in a letter to me, said, uh, I've read Bomber and I don't know why you claim it's an anti-war book because I think it's a pro-war book, you see. And I wrote back and said, but I never said it was an anti-war book. All I can say is it's a war book. And if you like to experience the things that happen in this book, you will enjoy being in a war and I sincerely advise you to get into one at the earliest possible opportunity. That all I was doing was mirroring uh, the research I'd done about the war, and I approached it with the same clinical attitude that I would have approached the Thirty Years' War or any other historical battle, had I been able to contact survivors and eyewitnesses. I looked at it, I chose to write it as a fiction format because I was more at home like that. I set it on a fictional day so that this enabled me to make a mixture of facts in a way that they didn't actually happen. But I certainly didn't exaggerate. There is no happening in that book which is exaggerated. In fact, uh, the, it, that raid which I have described in detail is a minor raid. Uh, although there's a lot of violent action in your book, and again you researched it, uh, uh, um, a gull flies through the windscreen yeah. of Cocker, one yeah. of the German aces, and, and splits his face open. Yeah. Another man flies out without a parachute and he makes a 12-inch indentation to the ground and splits open like a slaughtered animal. Yeah. And, uh, and that uh, brings you up short. Yeah. There isn't any uh, violence in, in the sense of what fills most, many books nowadays, not only um, action books, but all... The, of people um, stabbing, killing, blood spotting, and yeah, all. Right. There's no reveling in violence, just as there's no reveling in sex. This is obviously deliberate yes. policy on your part. Yeah, well, it is, but I, I, I actually don't like to look at a boxing match. I mean, I find a boxing match offends me. I find great difficulty in watching it. I'm not attracted to, uh, to violence. I, I actually find if I see a film in which there is a lot of violence, I want to leave. If I possibly can, I will. If I'm watching it on the television, I switch off if I can do so without giving a lot of people a bad time. I don't like uh, violence. I don't like uh, this idea. Can I just say that the, there is a school of writing uh, that, that exists particularly in Hollywood that has a moral belief that if you show the bullies being violent, you can end your story by having the people who were bullied show more violence towards the bullies than they ever believed was possible. And we're all supposed to applaud, and that's all right. And I, that's absolutely not all right with me. I don't believe that I want to write any books in which violence triumphs. I think there is... Uh, I believe that there is a responsibility as a writer to not demonstrate, to, to, to try to show 
that intellect triumphs over violence, which I think is a basic code that I subscribe to. I felt that this was the only book I've ever written in which expressing and describing violence was a legitimate way of telling the story, but I tried not to use that violence in any titillatory way, and I tried not to appeal to any perverse or perverted ideas about violence. I think it's a great responsibility. I think the writer must take this very, very seriously uh, as part of his job. After Bomber, you published a collection of short stories, uh, Declarations of War, and these wars are in different periods of time. They're in Imperial India, they're in uh, Vietnam, they're in um, the Second World War, of course, and one of them is uh, even in the uh, Civil War, the American yeah. Civil War, yeah. Discipline. How did you come to uh, write that? Well, I, I've been interested. One day, perhaps, I'll write a book about the idea of physically insignificant people being sort of great warriors within the uh, structure of modern machines and, and so on, that the age when only people of great muscular strength were um, successful in military terms has long since passed. And in, in this story, I wanted to have a, a, a diminutive person who was not respected or regarded by the men uh, under his command. This would be Winkelstein. Winkelstein is a, is a um, small Jewish immigrant who has come to America and to some extent been disappointed by what he's found there and rather challenged by his uh, inclusion in an American conflict that he really has no great in interest in. But he continues to do his bit and do his best once he finds himself swept up into this uh, idea. And he doesn't really realise the power of life and death that he holds over the... He's a sergeant. He, do, he uh, only gradually discovers, with the aid of the officer, who despises him almost as much as his men do. With no element of sadism, he has found himself actually sending men to more or less certain death. And I've hinted at what would be the reaction of the men in this uh, unit and the way in which they in future would cease to despise him and would certainly cease to irritate him uh, consciously because they realise that their life, uh, their continuance of their lives, are going to depend upon uh, making him happy in one, one way or another. Since Bomber you've written two spy novels but your latest book, Fighter, is a non-fiction successor to Bomber. Why did you decide to write a non-fiction book? I felt it would be a good idea to embark on a long project and I decided that for my own amusement I would write a, what was going to be first a 12-chapter book. Not for publication necessarily, but a 12-chapter book describing the Second World War in terms of the technical accomplishment. When I started to, to do this, and, and I did it as a hobby, I did it for fun, I realised that I wouldn't be able to do it as a 12-chapter book. I would have to do it as a 12-volume series of books. So this really simply provided me with a chance to, to make a reading list and to study what I consider to be 12 important battles of, of the world, choosing them so that each one I would have an area of technology such as submarines or aircraft carriers or tanks or radar and so on. Oh, I should say this, this is all sort of with my little drawings and maps and so on. A very personal thing, very much like a, a very big notebook. I decided to do exactly that and instead of taking the first battle that I had worked on, uh, there was an element of self-indulgence, I should say, that because I plan to go to each of these worldwide battlefields and to talk to survivors and so on. So there's a, I'm interested in it in a sort of selfish point of view. But of course, once I decided that it could be published, I could be even more self-indulgent. <laughs> I had a rational for, um, for actually spending money and spending more time on it. And finally, I took the Battle of Britain as, as an area in which I'd done a lot of research and, and to be the first one published.
it is a completely a historical book. It's a history book, a straightforward history book. But it takes technology from, for instance, it says, if the Battle of Britain was fought by mono, metal monoplanes, why did the Wright brothers build a biplane, for instance? I mean, as a beginning. Um, the, it takes radar and says, who thought of radar? And the surprising answer is that Germans thought of radar and developed very good radar before the British had even thought of having radar. Um, so I took the, the technical development of these two basic weapons, the monoplane fighter, and only two nations had highly developed monoplane fighters at the, ready for action and in production by 1940. And because I'd met so many pilots during uh, the research for Bomber, I had a whole ready-made uh, number of people that I could correspond with. I'd found many of those people I talked with who had become high-ranking officers by the time I was talking, the latter half of the war, were fighter pilots or were lower-ranking officers during the Battle of Britain. And very often the conversation moved off and we were talking about the Battle of Britain. I felt that the Battle of Britain, what I'd read of the Battle of Britain, had left me with enough of a distorted impression to, su to be surprised by what I uncovered. And I felt that what I uncovered was worth putting in book form. So the book is really five different books which I've uh, sort of threaded together. But to tell the story of the Battle of Britain in tactical terms, to, to not as one damn thing after another, as Arnold Toynbee said so much history was, but to show it as a cause and effect and to show how each side responded to what the other side did in a way that one might describe a game of chess. Finally, you are very successful um, and you're successful at a lot of things, fiction and non-fiction, and writing dossiers and writing cookery books and all the rest of it. And yet, of many of the writers I've spoken to over the last few years, you live, live the most uh, dedicated life of, uh, of all, and you're probably the most hard-working writer I've talked to. Um, why do you think that is? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm delighted to hear you say that. I mean, my Puritan instincts uh, abs absolutely <laughs> glow at that <laughs> description. You couldn't please me more. Well, I think uh, there is, if you grow up, to see your parents working very, very hard. Uh, my father died before he had any uh, retirement. Uh, he, he worked sort of from the day he was born, I suppose, until the day he died. My mother uh, similarly worked hard all her life. I think that has an effect upon a child and it makes it very, very difficult to... Uh, in fact, it makes it very difficult for me to do a lot of things that are completely legitimate. When I said to you earlier that I didn't read very much fiction, then undoubtedly one of the reasons for this is because if I'm reading fiction and Isabel's doing the laundry, I feel immensely guilty about that. It seems unreasonable, whereas if I'm thumping a typewriter, I don't have to feel so guilty. So I think that there, that is one element. And I think in the same way that I've sometimes met men who have said, I'll work in the plastics factory making a fortune until I'm 40, and then I will paint works of art. By the time they're 40, they've got so used to running the plastics factory that they can't do anything else. And it's the same with me. I've got so used now, you say, to working that no matter how I would like to not work and how much I admire people who don't work, because that in itself is not, I am stuck with it.